Good morning, everybody. Tuesday morning, jeffcentral.com. It is the 8th of February. What's uh, happening? We've got um, Bulelo and the ghost voice of Lebang. She's, uh, she's here. <laughs> and say hello to us. She can communicate like a spirit from the afterlife. But we can't see her yet. We're trying to figure out her camera. She's actually sitting in the studio with um, Bulelo. But we're having trouble connecting to her camera. So don't stress. She's there. But uh, we're getting out there going. Hey, um, Bulela, when are you leaving for America? T- tomorrow, if you know what I mean. Wow. Tomorrow. Yeah. No messing around, huh? You're just going straight at it. No, you- no, no. We're not, we're not mucking about. I'm closer. We gave you the vote. We gave you Sia Golisi. You yes. know what I mean? We don't, we, don't, we don't muck about. We don't muck about with the yeah. smallest, small anyana, uh, as the great uh, yeah. vendor leader said uh, the small anyana organization. We, we're not a small anyana organization. <laughs> Shout out. Sam. So just explain to everybody what you're going to be doing over there because we're going to be following your whole thing. Yeah. So we, we, we're off to, uh, we, we land in Jersey and then immediately we fly to LA. So it's going to be like 22 hours. Uh, are you doing we'll LA? Drop off our, just, yeah. Just so, so we go to the Super Bowl actually. So, so expect Ooh, some content from the Super nice. Bowl. Excellent. Event, you know? Yeah. And this year is really cool. Like, do you remember when every single white guy thought they were a rapper when Dr. Dre released that 2001 album? So, you, you know, it'll be great to hear every single white person rapping uh, Dr. Dre's 2001 uh, album because oh, yes. he'll be there. One of my yes. favorites, Mary J. Blige. is going to be there. Mary J. Blige. Yeah, hmm. Mary J. Blige is an ultimate for me. So she'll be playing at halftime. Uh, Snoop Dogg's uh, Eminem, um, which I'm lukewarm on. But, but man, I'm looking okay. forward to it. It's going to, right. like as a sports nerd, right? So th- this is the one I never, I never thought I'd be at. Yeah, so but, it's an um, awesome thing. <clears throat> but the the Super Bowl isn't really about the football. Uh, yeah, yeah, it becomes a, it's a bit it's a little bit of a hot uh, okay. show. Look, 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 it's, it, yeah, it becomes an event. I mean, I'm big in the NFL, so so for me it is. Uh, I can ignore all of it. But Mary J. Blige, I'll probably have my fan moment, um, and then we move on the very next week, and we're at the NBA All Star Game in Cleveland. So so we've oh, got a awesome. super pack like first three weeks. So hoping to bring back uh, some of that content that I've always said, that world-class stuff from Africa Excellent. to the world. Yeah. And, and then and then we based out in New York. So we'll, we'll head back to New York at the end of February and then let the games begin, as they say. So, yeah, yeah. Really, really, really excited. Huh? Look who's here. It's Lebang. How's it, Lebang? Knock, knock. I'm hearing a little bit of a doubling on your voice going on there. You're in the studio with um, Bulelo this morning. I am. And mm. I can also hear myself doubled. Mm. Yeah, just uh, one of those channels needs to be killed. And there's, uh, you can see some people. Yes. Oh. Hang on, <clears throat> now you can hear me again. No, no, um, no. Actually, what? What's wrong? Uh, you just need to mute your. Uh, yeah. uh, okay, it sounds like we're all doubled up. Like uh, we've got our demon voices going this morning. <laughs> so listen, um, Bulela, yeah, that yeah. sounds pretty amazing, man. I mean, most people. <laughs> never get to see a super bowl and you're going to be in the stadium yeah um, yeah yeah we're going to be we're going to be doing it properly gareth while i'm there it's um it's not like a holiday you know is i've yeah, always yeah. wanted my show to be this and uh yeah it, like it's amazing you know man. i'm big on on doing what i say so it's it's time it's time let's Good. do it man well i also yeah. i have to tell you i've been to two nba all-star games and uh, amazing I went in 2004 and in 2014. 2004, it was in LA as well. Um, and t- uh, 2014, it was in New Orleans. And oh, wow. it was absolutely bloody amazing. You know, it's such a show. Like, I remember the game is part of it, right? Because you've got all these, um, these amazing big names playing in the All-Star game. That's why it's called the All-Star game. But um, you do have the two teams who are actually competing. And then there's all this other stuff that happens around the stadium and in the stadium. And it's just magical. It's like monstrous lighting arrangements. And, you know, the advertising is just the most incredible advertising you can get. And they've got those cams that are like focused in on a couple and then the couple have to kiss. And then they've got a camera that does like uh, pulls celebrity faces out of the crowd and stuff. And it's, a, it's amazing who goes to these things. Yeah. No, the, the All-Star game is a little bit different, as you say. And, and what's quite nice, is we're going to have quite nice access to some of the players, which is going to be quite a cool way to get to enjoy the, uh, the NBA All-Star game as opposed to just being a fan. You know, like we're going right. to get there a little bit before a really big African superstar. We're going to hang out with for a little bit. So, so we, we yeah, I'm exci- I mean, for a guy like me, 
you know, nice. it's stealing doing what I do for work. That's so, so cool. And this is the next level. That's it like is, huh? bucket list vibes. Like yeah. top yeah. 10 places that you need to go in your one lifetime. The Super Bowl has to be there. It just has to. And like you're saying, Gareth, it maybe may not be for the actual like main event, but everything mm. around it must just be so exciting. The energy, the people oh. running around. It gives me like carnival vibes. Like it's just a nonstop 24-7, just a jam. And if you if you are into like star spotting and you and you care about celebrities, the NBA All Star Game is just amazing because you're up close and personal with these people. I mean, you mm. you could be sitting next to like some really really famous Hollywood actor, uh, oh, yeah. singer. <sighs> there was I remember Ashton Kutcher and Demi Moore were sitting together at the one game I was at, and it was like a big deal. But they were they were probably like three rows in front of me and like four people to the, 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 the left. It was unbelievable. And you're like, okay, mm. if, if this is something they want to come to and you know, it's a, it's a pain in the backside when you're a very, very famous celebrity because you've got people like taking pictures of you the whole time and like, people pushing you out of the way or in the way or like trying to get to meet you. And they must really love it to come to something like that. And it is, it's an awesome show. And there's an interesting comment someone made just now about formats uh, here. Congo Chris says, Football is a terrible sport format. Two hours of ads and 16 minutes of actual play, only in America. <laughs> but that's the, that's the whole point, is that they can yeah. sell all kinds of shit during that time. So they, they really do. And there's ad breaks all the time. But what they're clever about is that during the ad breaks in the stadium, there's always stuff going on. So they've mm. got people on the field doing things. They've got people in the audience doing things. There's stuff happening on the big uh, Jumbotron screens. It's like a... It's a, it's an assault on your senses. You can't you can't go to these things and go. I'm bored because there's not a single second to be bored. It's phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. Americans get it. Yeah. No. yeah, entertainment. They've got it on lock, and they're pulling out all the stops. I actually saw the was it like the commercial or something? They have like Kendrick Lamar in there, Dr. Oh. Dre, Eminem. When I saw Eminem, I almost lost my mind. I was like, Lord, why am I not a billionaire so I can just fly there right now and just like come back <laughs> oh. whenever I want? Because damn, it's like not a crazy a lineup. Why am I not um, Bulelo Tinta? You know, exactly. Yeah. Why? What is the reason? <laughs> we'll, 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 listen, we all get out of bed one, one foot at a time. I, I put my shoes on one, uh, one shoe at a time yeah, as well. Yeah, you, you know. so, so I humble. mean, exceptional, certainly. You, we're, you, we have you the know. same 24 hours. <laughs> 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 but, but, but just, you, you know what I'm really looking forward to and something that I'm a massive fan of is American college sport is something I've always been yeah. fascinated about because mm-hmm. it pains me that Bafana Bafana will never play in, in a, any major tournament again unless we host. Is that I've always loved how they've understood to create those channels from college to the professional leagues. It's so yep. professional. Mm. So we're going to be at Kansas University as well. And I mean, they're one of the big five basketball programs. And America yes. has a sensation called March Madness, right? It's, so it's essentially college basketball. And the Kansas is proper this year. Uh, they, I mean, they, they, we, we're talking about them going proper. So we're going, to get, we're going to get involved with them and maybe follow their, their or definitely follow their journey towards March Madness as well. So that's going to be more content that I think, I, I don't think we've, or I, I certainly haven't seen it done the way we want to do it and as interactively with like a top end program. So, we, so I want to bring people, people like that as well. So, you know, there, there's a lot of African players there as well. So which is going to be cool. Been, People have been following the MKT show up to now, and yeah. uh, you're going to have to change things there while you're traveling, obviously. But you, you're still going to be putting up regular content. So if they've subscribed, no, no, daily. The, the, the podcast goes on. Okay, no, good. no, the podcast goes on. The the show goes on daily. We we're not changing that. The, this is an addition to what we do now. So no, please don't, uh, please don't fret. You know, as they say. <laughs> That's so exciting, dude. I, like my my one wish for you is like for you to land get there smell that fresh american air and just breathe out and find love like i i I see all the work and the yeah we're going there for sports nba nfl sure just find a girl lock eyes with her and potentially never come back to south africa because you have no reason to like that's my true wish for you dude I receive those, those I think, blessings. I think she's trying to throw you out of the country. That's what I think. She just, come on, come on, she just come disguised on. that really well, but she wants you out of South Africa. Yeah, good riddance. Good riddance. I, I, I know people like Leban, you know, they, they, they kind of wrap uh, the, the uh-huh. poop in gold and they think we don't uh-huh. know, you know? Yeah, a, tur- a, tur- a, a spray painted turd is still. You is can still, still smell it. <laughs> 
All right. Hey, we've got, a, we've got a meet our intern a little bit later, and we've got a new intern at Cliff Central, and that's uh, Baka Bantu, who's going to mm -hmm. be uh, saying hello to us this morning. We'll check him out and find out what he's all about. You can get hold of us on the comment section here if you'd like to drop us a message. Don't be shy. Everybody wants to hear from uh, the new additions to the team. And uh, we would like to have you subscribe and like and all of that stuff too, please. If you can, that would be really good. Uh, Stig yeah. Mina says, you're dreaming the bung. MKT will come back single. <sighs> That's what I fear. <laughs> <laughs> That's my fear. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Listen, just because you people are unhappy in your relationship, stop oh. wishing happiness for me. Save all of your good wishes for, for yourself. Go. Yeah, yeah. Assemble. Here we go. You know? Okay, okay. Whatever. We'll see you in like three months. I won't forget that I was eavesdropping. I think it was last, was it last Tuesday or the Tuesday before? And you guys were having a massive argue. Well, not an argument. It was like this very impassioned discussion about like, you know, life choices and relationships and all of this stuff. And I just went, uh uh, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting involved in it. Karen, you literally Sorry. walked in, you heard one sentence, and you're like, okay, guys, bye. Uh, I'm sure. out. <laughs> like, um, no interest at all. And those you know, conversations are moving. I hear you, but mm. I've never been, I've never actually worked in an environment where I ever got to gossip. Um, mm. Obviously, we have the show and the show is like, you know, it's hardly gossip if you're broadcasting it to everyone. Um, yeah. and, and we do talk about our own lives, but I've never sat in like a corporate environment where people sit at desks and sit around each other and they, me, 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 me. it's never happened to me. I've never been in that environment. And I mean, I'd find it really boring, uh, you know, yeah. besides so I think, I mean, I don't know if I'd call it, you yeah. know, like, as you're saying that me, me, me gossip, there's definitely that part. But I think for the most part, it's like we're spending time in the space. And if there is something that is stressing me or there's something I just need to let out, I'm just going to let it out with the people around me who happen to be yeah. my colleagues. And if they've got good advice for me, it's a bit therapeutic, if I can say, you know, we don't just sit there and like trash talk each other. For the most part, no. we hope to gain some, yeah. you know, don't some, some good I'm yeah. not criticizing it. I'm, I don't have a problem with it. In fact, I think it's really important for people to like talk about non-work things at work. I think, you know, otherwise mm. you never really connect with those people. I just, for sure. not very, I'm not good at it. So usually when people start yeah. talking about, oh, have you heard that uh, Homo Lemo is seeing this girl and, uh, and uh, Simpiwe is now doing this uh, with, with her weekend. And I like some of the time I, I want to get involved, especially if it's on the show and there's like, Stuff that we, you know, that would be entertaining for the audience. But if it's just to know stuff, and there are people who like to know stuff, um, yeah. I'm just not That's one of those. Now. I'm, I'm like, nah, mm -hmm. it's okay, you can manage. You know, I'll be all right with that. I feel you. Umbilelo's like low-key like that as well. He's like very specific about when he'll hang with us. Like, hmm, uh, he are they worthy of my like presence he today? In, he climbed in. <laughs> All his limbs were involved in that conversation the last time. I walked in there and he was like, he was leading the, the whole discussion. So like, don't fall for that. I don't believe it for a second. Every now and then you got, you, you know, you got to keep your pulse on what the people, the, the proletariat is up to. Otherwise they'll, they will rise to chop your head off. The, the peasants. We, um, we must also, while we're promoting the MKT show, which is uh, on YouTube, and you can subscribe to that so you can get all of the info as um, Bulelo and, and team cover the United States and all these big sport events. And I think it will be uh, a fascinating insight into this because you'll be looking at it from the point of view of South Africa, looking at America and kind of understanding how they do things. Because they don't, they don't think they're any different because most Americans have never left America, right? Yeah. And they think that that's how the whole world is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and uh, to look at it from our point of view is sometimes really interesting because you it's almost like a cultural experiment, um, and you you immerse yourself in it and then you kind of get an idea of what's going on there. But you must also get into um, Life with Lebang, which is here on CliffCentral.com every Thursday from nine to ten. If you haven't listened to that yet, you got a lot of uh, things that you have to put in the diary this week. I have yep. uh, yesterday. I got so much done. I you know when you. When you get to like one o'clock and you're like, Gee, I've done all the stuff I needed to do. I just. Congrats. Really, yeah. I was like, really? I, I, w I was congratulating myself for at least half an hour. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> really? I'm telling you. 
it's a good feeling it's a very good feeling especially when you wake mm-hmm. up a little bit earlier than you usually do by 10 everything is like done you're just like waiting for meetings to happen it's a great feeling well, that's done, also one of the reasons well i mean all those people who are awake with us now and listening to the show live it's one of the reasons it's nice to be up early it's like you get you start your day you cram as much into that morning as you can and then if if the afternoon is chilled that's cool and you can you know take it easy you can you know, watch some tv you can maybe scroll through some social media you can maybe have a nap or whatever if you get everything done in the morning it feels like yes and and that includes yeah. like exercise and training and all of that stuff then you you just feel good about the day right you, you feel yeah, like you've absolutely it. meditating meditating are you, are, you, are you doing meditating is that something you do i am i'm doing like a like a, a spiritual you know thing like my first thing when i wake up in the morning i do not touch my phone like i can't like my alarm goes off switch that off and then like put it away and then just like sit in like silence just chat really? to the, the higher energies get my chakras on yeah it just kind of like helps to align like i speak to myself like hey this is what i want to achieve for today this is what i'm attracting for the day success um you know confidence blah 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 just so that by the end of the day i can look back and i'm like oh well i absolutely did all of that because i affirmed it in the morning and i'm trying to teach my kids the same thing so it's it's just nice to not wake up and just go oh who's saying what on twitter oh whatsapp oh hey who's like that's no, the best I, thing because i'm not involved in other people's things you know that's, uh, that's super healthy from mm. a from a mental health point of view you no, definitely. To, not get, to not get straight into like technology first thing in the morning is really good yeah and you know, just to get, ground yourself, start the day with the right things in place. If you don't do mm-hmm. that stuff, you're just you're asking for a shit day to happen. Just by the way, while we're talking about um, shit things that happen, Simpiwe has just given us some inside info here. She says, when um, Bulelo gets his biltong and he asks, what's the story? Just know it's ticket. You're going to get into what's happening in your life. <laughs> and he's just gathering content. Just <laughs> gathering content so you can either use it on the show. Like we've actually agreed as the hub to not overshare with Umbulelo because you'll be chilling at home listening to the show and you'll hear a story and it starts sounding a bit too familiar for yeah. your liking. <laughs> Jiggy Jiggy, you, it's actually your life. You said, you said to him, hey, please, this is not for this is not for air. And then hey, you know, disclaimer. Like, Umbelelo, please don't tell this to Gareth and the whole world. This one stays here. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah okay, yeah. Then he sits in the corner just, like, writing everything down. The only secrets are those which you take to your grave. Ooh, we... You must just know that, guys. I said, believe. So... <laughs> so someone said here, um, Bulelo, please don't come back with an American accent. You will be mocked. Ooh. That's right. Hey, yo, bro, what are you talking about, bro? You mean like Tebow Touch? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Ooh. Hey, y'all, Gareth, I don't know what you be talking about, play. Yeah, man, that's like far yeah. south, bro. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that dog of mine. <laughs> and Congo Chris says, no, your Model C accent is too stone. No way he'll get an American one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Model C. Yes. <laughs> that's exactly it. That's the one. <laughs> I'm just trying to be an oak culture. Oh, oaks. <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> like. Jeez, like. Are you, Bongo, you're really affecting my confidence, hey? Jeez, bro. Well, I um, I've discovered there's a word that that my family we used as kids, and that my dad used. My mom never used it, and that our family friends, their dad also used it. And I discovered it was like boarding school speak. And there, there are some words that guys who've been to boarding school use that yes, they know what it means, but no one else knows what it means. So what would happen is if we got sweets or something. Either my dad or uh, our, our family friend, the dad there, he would go, "Ops," like as in yeah. give me some "Ops." You know what "Ops" is, right? Yeah, I didn't yeah, know yeah. what. We we just used it, and we assumed everybody knew what that was. But like, it means give me some. So when you got into the real world and you started using it, it was just like it's like you know, if someone had uh, something nice on their plate, I'd be like "Ops," and they'd be, like, "Huh? What are you talking about? <laughs> what are you yeah, using in that foreign one. language?" Yeah. So there's a couple of others. I just can't remember what they are at the moment. But there were, there were all kinds of, of, of little words that seemed to develop at, uh, at boarding schools. And, and it was a very uniquely kind of South African thing. Obviously, I didn't go to boarding school, so I didn't know them. But I learned a lot of them from my dad. And uh, I'm sure, like, you knew a couple of these too, Mbulelo. Mm-hmm. There was probably a whole way of communicating that you guys used to have at boarding school that the rest of us didn't know. 
a whole different world. If you say, yeah, my Betty's got me gated this weekend, guys, I can't make it. So being gated is when you, you do something terrible at school and then you can't like go out on the weekend or, or go, go home or something. So you're gated. Yeah. So yeah. So Lynn's got me gated, bro. And if but it's like, your, it doesn't, your it doesn't, is your girlfriend, Betty, right? your girlfriend, yeah, yeah. Well, well, not necessarily. It's it's a, it's an option that you've got on the table at the moment. Be- Betty, uh, Betty's Betty and girlfriend aren't the same thing. You need to uh, learn this. So yeah. Betty's like a girl, yeah, that yeah. is not your girlfriend. Yeah, yeah, no, she's got me gated this weekend. I can't, guys. It's you know what I mean. I already, I, I already, I already rented the movie and I already promised her because her mom's right. out of town or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> So let's uh, let's uh, let's get him in here because uh, Buck Bunt is already he's he's messaging on the screen here. He's like touched it six months in the U.S. and came back with ten years of accent. <laughs> <laughs> you wrong? Well, I, he picked that thing up and he put it in his pocket and said, "You are coming with me to South Africa." He never let it go. <laughs> is he around? Is he around in the building at the moment? I not yet. He's he's probably okay. on route. Yeah. When you I actually met him the other day. Like I met him like in yeah. person. And he walks into the studio. And you know, like, usually when people walk into the hub, it's almost like, oh, they just look around or, like, awkwardly. There's no, like, hi, welcome. This is where you go. This is what you... It's like, figure yourself out and just yeah, get gelled in because it's that great. Um, He just kind of, like, gelled in, bro. He just, like, hey, what's up? How you doing? This is who I am. This is what my name means. Yeah, I'm here to see Rena, but I'm, like, 45 minutes early. Please don't judge me. He just kept going. And I was like, whoa, you are in the right place at the right time, sir. Welcome. So I'm excited to chat to him today. I think I think he's 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 got something interesting but, about I mean, him. You want you want to talk? You just you you interviewed me one Saturday, and then <laughs> next thing, next thing you were in our offices and you were working with us. <laughs> Literally, it happened exactly like that. Exactly like that. Yeah. Like so yeah, no, it takes takes one to know one. But I mean, again, right place at the right time. You know, mm-hmm. aligning your energies and your chakras. Oh, uh, here so, we go. Getting the eleven eleven. Click, oh. click, click, oh, candles, candles, candles. People mustn't tell me that uh, Cliff Central isn't churning out some talent and aren't finding the good people and giving people opportunities because, my God, over the last, we'll be turning eight in May. Mm. We, we at one point had 40 shows a week. Remember? For those people who've been around the whole time, we had 40 shows a week, Lebang. I can't hear you, Lebang. I think it's because um, Bolelo switched his thing off. So I'm just going to hang on. Let me add you in there. That now I can hear you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. When okay. when Lelo goes off, then you go off as well because you're coming through the same feed. Yeah. Um, okay, he's I'm back. Sorry. When we started, we had like 40 different shows a week and we gave everybody and anybody who wanted an opportunity a chance to like put a show mm-hmm. together. And you'll remember there was like, there were drunk people doing shows. There were old people doing shows. There were kids doing shows. There were people who'd never been behind a microphone in their life who started doing shows. Mm. And I mean, a lot of those people have gone on to do amazing stuff but it's it it really makes me feel good in a way that i didn't expect because when we started the business it was like well you know we'll just take my show and put it on online and we'll turn Mm. it into podcasts but before uh we even had a chance to launch we were like "Mm, let's expand this a little bit we don't know who we're going to meet who we're going to find let people come in and show us how they would do it and like that was completely breaking the mold it's not so much that we started, you know, making podcasting mainstream or any of that stuff. It was that all these amazing people came out of the woodwork and started doing their own thing and using our platform to do it. It was awesome. It really was special. Anyway, I got this email from Andrea just before we, we move on to headlines. She said, I understand your reticence regarding completing the census. After a similar census in the UK, listen to what they did there. The government instituted something called a bedroom tax for every unused bedroom in your home. It was eventually canceled due to public outcry. I understand this maybe is nothing to pummy, but it could make you pissed off. Thanks to the team for brightening up my mornings. Well, thank you, Andrea. But imagine, imagine if they're in South Africa, they decided that they would tax you on every room in your house that wasn't used. Well, the only people that would be affected are like the middle class and rich people. So, like, but still, I mean, like, then all people are going to do is like make their, you know, they're going to lie because no one's going to say, oh, well, I've got three spare bedrooms. Uh, if they know that the, this is why you don't fill in the census. I'm telling you now, when those guys come knocking on my door, I'm not going to help them. Yeah, especially if there's potholes. You, you, you know, South Africans right. don't like paying tax. 
because of we can see with that time man no, 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 no. No. script yeah if i'm in denmark that's why they don't mind paying 60% tax cuz i can now drive my tesla you know uh, from wherever i want now I, I can't even go to Woolworths to get my mangoes oh, without yeah. getting like Lebang the bust her mangoes. car. Yeah, no, I mean they are yeah. organic. Let's uh, let's get that straight immediately. But um, y- you know, South Africans don't even like paying tax now. No. Forget forget no. about now. E back room. I must pay for e back room as yeah, well. Yeah, no. Aye, aye. And, and you say only, only middle class people, but like when Bulero talks about the back room, you know how yeah. many people in this country who are like working class people. They poor. They might live in in uh, informal settlements or in, in townships, and they have the back room, and they rent the back room out to someone else. For sure. Can you imagine if you imagine they come to you and they're like, mm, "I'm sorry, that back room, government want their share of it." Be like, <sighs> "Yeah, F no, you. Yeah, you're not getting any more out of me. You've got enough." Yeah, but the, the UK the UK is unique. They tax everything. I mean, you pay like three, I think, three different types of yeah. uh, property tax there. That was ridiculous. Carl says, they will tax. Ooh. Please don't say this so loud. You'll give these morons ideas. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Andrea. <laughs> Andrea. All, all right. You want to know what's in the headlines? Interested? Sure. Okay. I always have to check because sometimes people don't give a shit. Um, you know, sometimes the news is just not interesting or you don't want to hear it because it's bad and depresses you. Well, 15 suspects were arrested on Monday in connection with corruption at South African police for the acquisition of PPE at 1.9 million rand. You know, that PPE thing in 2020, every single deal it looks like that was made for PPE was corrupt. You know, the Free State, they had like a 30 million tender that went out for PPE, which was all bullshit. Nobody got any PPE, but someone got a whole lot of money. Um, KwaZulu Natal, there was another tender that went out by the uh, KZN provincial government. It's another like 20 million or something. Also stolen, no PPE delivered. The ANC must have had a big meeting. They must have called a big meeting when coronavirus started and they must have been like comrades um, there's an opportunity here (laughs) for us to um, let us see, uh, uh, get the cream off the top here. But instead of just the cream, we must go for the whole pot. Give them no PPE. Because remember how scared we were in the beginning with uh, coronavirus? Remember how everybody was like, oh, Jesus, we're all going to get this and it's going to kill millions of people. Especially we were worried in South Africa because we have this immunocompromised population, right? A lot of people are living with HIV. A lot of people whose immune systems are not working 100% of the way that they should, even with antiretrovirals and all of that stuff. So we were worried. And what do these crooks go and do? They help themselves to PPE tender money. It's unbelievable. So they've arrested mm-hmm. six police officers. A national police spokesperson, Colonel Atienda Mate, said that the accused were arrested in the early hours of Monday in Gauteng and Limpopo. They had been charged with fraud, theft, corruption, and forgery arising from a scheme to unlawfully benefit a third party supplier of latex gloves for saps in April 2020. Oh my God. Do you have anything to say to that? Anything? We knew. What's what's new? No surprises. Just continuous embarrassment living in South Africa, knowing that if it's not corruption, it's like more corruption. And what's worse is that there is no consequence. Not a single person is like, okay, I'm accountable. It's me. These six people were arrested. Let's count the small victories. (sighs) Okay. It's a start. It's a start. But, But you know what it is? It's the... This is once again why the being close is the winning team. We were doing corruption, but at least we weren't doing it in your face. You you know, I always say to people, Uh when you cheat on your wife or your girlfriend, it's not about the cheating. It's don't make me look like a fool in public is often a bigger problem when I've spoken to females, right? It's about, don't do it here, man. The thing about close is we're doing the corruption, but at least we're wearing, you know, the corruption wears a suit. No, since we... Gave it up. Now people are eating with their hands. Now there's bop in the beard. Yeah, no. You speak like you've got so much experience. Oh, I'm Please closer. Tell us more. I'm closer. I, co- no, cor- no, tell us cor- more. Cor- cor- we are specialists. Hang on, one. Hang on. There's bop in the beard. There's bop in the beard. <laughs> All right. 
let's move on. There's other stuff going on. Oh my Please. God. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> right? Un- unbelievable. Unreal. Um, Helen, Helen Zilla has won. <laughs> God, I'm not allowed to do a Helen Zilla accent, but I can do it. Please do. Please oh, do. Jeff. What you need to do. So, all right. Helen Zilla has won her Supreme Court of Appeal uh, dismissal because she applied to have the public protector's report on her controversial colonialism tweets reviewed and set aside. In its judgment delivered on Monday, the SCA said the High Court's decision to decline to review the public protector Busisu M. Kwebane's decision was erroneous. Kwebane previously found that Zilla's tweets about colonialism were in violation of the Constitution. I mean, do me a favor. You, you, I know that her tweet didn't go down well, right? And people were like, oh, you know, Helen Zilla, old school defending colonialism. And she was talking about Singapore, by the way, if you, if you bothered to read those. Oh, yeah. Everybody loves everybody loves getting upset. And no one uh, makes people more upset than old Gogo Helen, right? So yeah. everybody was pissed off. And then Busi Siwem Kwebani, who's done absolutely sweet bugger all as public protector. You remember who was there before her? Tuli Madonsela, remember? Old, remember old much, tools, yeah. Remember how much she got done? Well, if you invert all the stuff that the Tuli got done, Busi Siwe did none and more damage. So she went, she she hit rock bottom and kept on digging, whereas Tuli built, you know, a fortress. Anyway, so Zilla's won the, the case, and uh, no doubt she will be all over Twitter today saying, I told you so. So, <laughs> <Dr>. <laughs> I knew I was right. Brilliant. I knew I was right. <laughs> Don't fuck with me. Yeah, that's funny. So that's coming right up. Um, and then while we're talking about politicians who are doing stupid and unnecessary stuff, EFF's, uh, yes, says, Mbuyasen in Tlazi. He's going to face an intimidation charge for social media comments in response to Afri Forum. This is interesting. You know, there have to be, we said this the other day when there was a story about someone who was going to be personally sued for what they said on social media. Like, mm, this should and, start happening. This needs yeah, to happen. He did. Mm. So EFF member of parliament and former party spokesperson, Buisen Indlozi, could face possible charges of intimidation and interference with court processes because of comments he made on social media in response to AFRI Forum. Gauteng High Court heard calls from AFRI Forum's legal representative for the court to rule on whether comments made by Indlozi three days ago after the lobby group announced on Twitter that its civil case against the EFF would be getting underway, that those comments were tantamount to intimidation or interference with court processes. Um, he, he went on to say, uh, this is what he said. He said, basically, the dogs are scared, shoot, shoot, and added a bomb emoji. So you can't do that. Because in real life, if you went shoot, shoot, and you pointed at people, that's intimidation. Mm. So the same goes for social media. I mean, dude, um, were you saying Glossy meant to be the, the smartest guy in the EFF, right? Everybody says he's he's really, and I've met him and he is. He's, a, he's an intelligent guy. You say that, though. You're a moron. And now you're going to have to pay. So mm. intimidation charges, uh, threats of violence. It's dumb. You don't, you don't threaten to shoot people. You don't threaten to bomb people, even in a joke, because then they can sue you. And that's what's going to happen here. So let's see what uh, what goes down there. So more politicians doing dumb stuff. Um, Emmanuel Macron from France is going oh. to is going to the Ukraine and the Russia because he is going to sort it out. Yeah, right. Anyway, he was headed to Moscow on Monday, hoping to find common ground with Vladimir Putin over the Ukraine. How do you think that's going to go? How do you see hey, hey. how do you see it unfolding? <laughs> <laughs> it says, come in, Manuel. Those are my dogs. I scared Merck. Uh, you remember that, uh, that yeah. dumb bimbo from the east of Germany? I scared her out with it. What do you want? What do you think you're going to achieve here, and young you man? 10 minutes. I'm, I'm out. I'm going to go ride a bear on a meme again. No, nah, come he's on. Like, <laughs> he's like, um, he's in the corner of the room. And Emmanuel's like, oh, my God. I don't want to. <laughs> I'd like to offer you croissant, please, Mr. No. Putin. <laughs> Put oh, like, no. on. <laughs> That's hilarious to me. That's <laughs> hilarious to me. So it's not, I mean, this is a waste of time, right? Because Jeez. Vladimir Putin's the kind of guy who will smile, shake your hand. And then when the doors close and the press leave, he'll go, get the fuck out of my country. And if you mm. think you're here to tell me what to do, I have 
a whole lot of guns trained on you right now that will make a very different comment if you don't just get out of my way. Plus, France at this point and much of Europe needs Russia because Russia supplies the gas that keeps the, the, the whole of Europe warm in the winter. You know, it's, it's, it's a no-win situation. And this could have been avoided. But, you know, the EU was just such a bureaucracy and they, they quite liked snuggling up to Russia and China for a while. Now you must reap the whirlwind. I wish I could be uh, more sympathetic, but I'm not. So German Chancellor Olaf Scholz will also on Monday meet with US President Joe Biden in Washington as Western leaders look to maintain a united front in their biggest showdown with Russia since the end of the Cold War. There's this weird thing that you know, if I were an American taxpayer, I'd be like, why the hell are we being relied on so heavily through NATO and, you know, various American uh, military um, resources? We are being relied on by Europe to defend Europe. Why doesn't Europe defend itself? If I were an American taxpayer, I'd be like, I'm not paying for this shit anymore, right? Because uh, Europeans are pansies and, and we've seen it how many times now? No, the truth is Americans, the the... the, the the predecessors are the brave ones who left, whether for good or for bad reasons, right? The, all the soft Europeans stayed, and now you've inherited those. Uh, America plays its role. It's one thing I like about people like that is that we're not here to ask your questions because nobody likes people that get things done until things have to be done. Correct. The whole world isn't podcasts as much as I wish it was. There are, peop there are bad people who want to do bad things yeah. to your liberal <laughs> you know, existence somebody's got to hold that line. And also, I'm afraid that doesn't just happen off, um, over croissants and, um, and vodka. That's, that's not how it goes. So Vladimir Putin does not give a shit about the um, soft liberal policies of Western Europe. They are hardcore nationalists in, in Russia. And he has an iron grip on things. He's not that interested in free speech or in LGBTQ rights or in immigration concerns. He doesn't care about any of that stuff. He's like, no, Russia strong. Yeah. Russia, uh, use, Russia use might to against you, assholes. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, to, to his sort of American, uh, I mean, America probably 120 years ago stance is that Russia is a bit of a miracle since he took over. I mean, you think Gorbachev was what, 92? That whole collapse. Um, no, 89, 89 is in the. Yeah. The war came down. Then, then there was that great drunken president. Do you remember Boris Yeltsin? Boris Yeltsin. <laughs> Boris Yeltsin was drunk from morning to night. In fact, I think he was drunk for the entire decade of the nineties. I don't. And then Slobodan day. came along and did his and whole maza in, in but Serbia. Was, but I mean, it was. You, you know what I mean? You you, you think right. of that whole region. And what what Putin's done? Listen, I'm not yeah. saying I'm a Putin guy. I'm just saying, people that get it done, unfortunately, in the world we live in, it's it's just you you got to do it. Otherwise, uh, you, you know, Vlad, Vlad is an impressive guy, even if you don't like him. Oh you yeah, have to, you know, a lot of people don't like him, just like a lot of people didn't like Trump. But um, strong men like that get shit done. They force things through. They make things happen. And all of the little collaborative communal let's do this together kumbaya people when when a guy like putin steps into the ring those people just get pushed aside immediately you have to force progress but people don't like to do hard things like, like which is you have to force progress you have to force people to win winning is not easy so in if you are winning in in winning environments you've been forced by somebody it, it doesn't just happen well riet riet says the French sorting out anything will usually result in a swingers party. Oh, remember that guy in the gay orgy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, in, exactly. in Brussels. And, and he was, he was anti-homo. Remember the homophobic guy? And then it turns yeah. out he's at a, homo, a gay orgy. Isn't it always like that, though? The people who yes. are like, most concerned about the gay people end up being mm. the most like secretly and, and, and dangerously gay. Like they're the ones mm. who are doing orgies and you know, that kind of shit. Dangerously gay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about those two words being put next to each other. Dangerously gay. <laughs> dangerously gay. You get dangerously gay. Yeah, yeah. Be gay, yeah. but being dangerously gay. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> All right. So, uh, lots of things to get to this morning, but I want to do something because you all know Law, uh, Lorraine Maisel, right? Law is uh, an old friend of the show, and we've had her on the show many times, and I love her, and she's got the greatest laugh in the world. Anyway, uh, she told me. 
she uh she's she's been with this guy called brad who's amazing and i found out that brad is actually a really well-known numerologist and you know we talked about numerology on the show before and there's some people who are heavily into it there's some people who don't like it at all don't believe in it i think it's always interesting to explore these things and brad is so good at this stuff he sent me a little uh, a, a voice note um just you know out of out of nowhere he felt like he felt like doing this for me which was awesome and he basically told me what the year has in store for me in terms of the numbers because you have your own number your your kind of your birth date and then you have your your name as another number and there are all these other numbers that attach to you and it then depends what time you're in like now we're in 2022 obviously what does this mean for you going forward and brad sent this fascinating thing and look obviously it's fascinating to me because it pertains to me but i thought we'd get him on this morning and find out a little bit more about numerology find out about what the numbers mean um and then look at 2022 for a you know for a kind of overview for all of us because there are going to be some things that affect all of us so first of all welcome brad nice to see you man hi hi gareth thank you so much for having me on the show hi team and hi hey, to your viewers. listen you wake up early in the morning and you've got a a whole yeah. ton of clients and you send them each a personalized numerology chart for the day or for the month or for the year, depending on what they do for you, you know, what they've asked you for. I've yeah. got to tell you, this stuff is absolutely amazing. And it's been quite spooky because I've had the information beforehand. I've looked at it afterwards too. And I thought, wow, that was right on the money. There's some fantastic stuff that you've got here. How does numerology work and how did you get into it? Okay, so I got it through to a family line. Um, but can I take you, can I explain it in quite an easy way to explain it? Go for um, it. Okay, so there was this person called Joseph Campbell. Have you heard of him? He wrote the, mm -hmm. the, um, the Hero with a Thousand Faces. So he was born in the, like 1905, actually on the same date as Rena. And he, studied myths and legends, and he picked up a common story. And that's why I called it the hero with a thousand faces, because the story was the same. So I thought, wow, that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. Let me put the numbers onto it. So I started putting the numbers on it, and I saw a pattern form. So I can actually run you through the hero's journey and then show you through the numbers. It just gives you a sure. nice understanding. Of how yeah, the let's, go, let's, let's go let's go through it there are only nine okay. there are nine, there are nine numbers right and then there are two master Correct. numbers okay yeah there's actually nine master numbers as well so yeah oh, wow. um yeah so so we start with the ordeal okay i have been mean, sorry the ordinary world and that's like we as human beings being the sheep following the herd and then all of a sudden comes the call and the call can be represented by the number one because if you look at the representation the representation of the one it's actually a line and it represents a message coming down and they called it from heaven so that's actually a symbol and then okay. back again so normally what will happen is people refuse the call because they have fears and they don't want to go and we can see this in black like, stories so um in Star Wars, Luke Skywalker refuses. Um, Neo refuses to climb on the ledge. Okay. Then no. you meet the mentor. So the mentor is represented by the number two. And if you look at the representation of the two, it mm -hmm. actually looks like a person on their knees bowing towards the one. So right. this is where somebody comes in and advises us and helps us to make that step, to take that leap into the unknown and then we move into the three which is crossing the threshold and this is where you take the red or the blue pole there's no turning back if you take that step into the unknown there's no going back from there and then we move to trials and tribulations which is represented by the four and the four mm -hmm. if you look at the representation of the four it is a line into the earth okay mm -hmm. and now you test you test the structure. You test what you've built. It's okay. a testing year, difficult year. Okay, this is where the trials and tribulations come up. And 
at this point, we enter into the five, and the five has two points. So either we go back, so the circle going back, or we move forward. But at this right. point, you've changed forever. You've changed. And the five represents change. Could then we be. move into the six. And the six is the year that we are in now. As, yes. As, as because, a because 2022 is two, two, two. So you add them together and you get a six. Yes. Correct. And if you look at the four year, right, which is 2020, trials and tribulations, governments were tested, mm. systems were tested. Okay. Then came the five year, and the five year was like a riot. And you can yep. actually see, I mean, I told a lot of people in the beginning of the year that there was going to be major riots and they came to pass. So anyway, so now, now we're moving into the six and the six is like more balance. So we're coming back into equilibrium. The six actually represents the pregnant belly of the, of the woman. So that's the visual representation. So it's pregnant with possibilities, but we also meet allies and enemies. So at this point, you know who your friends are and who are not your friends. And you, then you make a decision on which way to go. Then you move into the seven. And the seven is when we go into the cave. And we could see this in the hobbits or Superman's cave or the bat cave. And these are the places where they go and get the knowledge or that artifact or that little piece of inspiration to help you along your journey. Normally... Uh, if we look at the subconscious, it would be like meditation. It's going into your quiet place. And isn't a seven also a very spiritual number, right? It is. So like the no. seven, the seven um, pieces on the menorah with that hold the candles, the seven days of the week, the seven wonders of the world, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, very mystical number. It actually represents, if you look at the visual representation, is a lightning bolt. So it's actually information that comes to you suddenly. Okay. And then all of a sudden you have an epiphany and then you take that and you use that and then you enter into the eight. Now the eight is uh, the only number besides the zero you can draw without lifting your pen. Mm -hmm. Okay. It also represents the two circles. The, the top circle is the spiral. Bottom circle is the material world. So whatever you envision in the spiritual, you now bring into the spirit, into the, the material world. This mm, is where we get our. If you, if you turn, if you sit the eight on its side, it's it's the symbol for infinity. Correct, correct, and it is also like they call it the battery because it just never stops. Mm. So it's an energy that just goes and goes and goes, and um, it's a it's an incredible number. This is where your gifts come. This is where the rewards come. And this is where you like seize the, the, the sword. But the sword also represents like cutting, separation. And then you hit the nine. And the nine is the journey home where you'll, face, you'll be faced with one more ordeal, the resurrection. And these are what all the nine means. And this is where people are tested in their nine years where everything breaks down but then you'll be ended if you just persevere and just keep on going yeah you then get the rewards and all right so 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 the nine takes you back to the start and i mean this is amazing because you take any number and you can reduce it to one of these nine numbers right yeah and this is where, yeah, the nine. This is where, and numerology is ancient ancient stuff so ancient, if, you, yeah. if you add up um, any number if you add up 406, for example, then six and four, you don't count the zero. Six and four gives you 10, which is a one. Yeah. So, so you can figure out pretty much any number in this way. And, and then that, that whole story that you've just told us now, this hero's journey, comes into play. So what, is, what, is, so what is a master number and what do those have to do with anything? What is an 11 and a 22, for example? So the, Okay, so let's work with the master number 22. So when we went into 2020, we knew, us numerologists knew it was going to be a big year because it was like a major lesson coming. It's, so the master number 22 is actually pushing for peace. And that's what its mission is. It's, it's got a mission to bring peace and harmony. However, I think, you know, if you go back, because history repeats and repeats and repeats, and that's the thing with the numbers. If you, pick, if you just go back to history, you'll pick up what you need to do in the, in the future. Mm -hmm. And we are actually in a 
four decade right now. So you look at 2020, which represents the four, four decade. So we're in a testing decade. Okay. Right. So a lot of trials and tribulations are going to come up. But the 22 is going to try and keep the peace because we're actually in water, like we could call this wartime. Okay. However, the, the master number 22 will help and keep peace in the world until we reach close to 2029. So this year, in the sixth year, there are potentialities for war. It's like you can just see, like it's just hanging in the balance. Well, we, were just talking, we were just talking about Russia and Ukraine, sure. So this is, this is a possibility. Now, can we yeah. just talk a little bit, because we've got like four minutes here, and I want to squeeze as much in as possible. Yeah. And obviously, Brad, you'll give your details if people want to get their own readings and all the rest. But let's just look at the... You know, the year for, for all of us, you mentioned like 2022, uh, sorry, 20, 2022 is a six. And you said that it's pregnant with possibility and there's a, a return yeah. to equilibrium and all of that stuff. A lot of people have had a very tough time over the last two years for all the obvious reasons. Now, is there something to look forward to here? Are there some numbers who are going to have a really good year? Are there some numbers who are going to have an awful year? What kinds of things can, can, we, can we look forward to from a numerology point of view? Well, with the six, it's a, it's, it is an interesting number because either we play the martyr, the victim of our circumstances, or we say, great, how do I like see what I've learned and take this forward? And how do I use the lessons that I, I, I've learned over the last two years and make a better life for myself? You see, some okay. people will be in a job right now and they'll say, yo, do I really want to go through this? Do I really want to answer to this person? And that's yeah. when the hero's thing will come in. And that's when you have to like either heed to the call or just keep on going with being a sheep in, a, in the herd or going on your own journey to transformation. And, you know, because at the end of it, when you reach your nine, you're wiser, you've grown, you bring the wisdom. And if you look at the representation of the nine, it's actually a big head coming from the right hand side, which is your creative side. Okay. And pregnant also with wisdom. It's just got so much to give the world. And either we, the, the big so, head could also be the ego as well. So Mbulelo is leaving for America. What's your date of birth, Mbulelo? Uh, 29, <clears throat> 29th of April, 1986. Okay, so what are we, what are we going to get for Mbulelo in the next couple of, of months and for the year in general? Like what, what, is, what is he looking at having? And then we'll get to Lebang, and then we've got to wrap it up, I'm afraid. So what do we got okay. for, for his birthday? What do we got? Um, okay, so first of all, do you know of the Iceman? Have you heard of Iceman, Vince uh, Van Hoff? Um, the name I is know familiar. him very well. Okay, so yeah, okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he, he uh, got, I've got his kettlebells at home, actually. Okay, so yeah, you actually got the same, um, the same matrix as him. So you've got the same algorithm. You run exactly the same as him. He's actually got a very, very, got so much potential. You just have to focus on what you want in life and you will manifest it. So if we look at his life path, because in numerology we work with life paths. Mm -hmm. um, he has the life path number three. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he's quite a, he, and you know, you chose your career. Why? Why? It's because the three is all about the communicator. It is also the, the number associated with a lively spirit, always wanting to go out and have fun and enjoy life. Okay. And so this year, you are in a three year. Okay. And the three year is like crossing the threshold, making it like you've made the choice to go into America. You, pro you probably were faced with that decision. And when it came, you said, I'm going. Nothing's holding me back. No, yeah, when, when you that's going to change you forever. Like he, he told us last Thursday, he's like, "Oh, by the way, I'm going to be in America." Yeah, peace <laughs> out. <laughs> All right, how about let's let's throw Lebang in here quickly because we've got uh, very okay. little time, and I just want um, to get everybody. I was born get on the 27th of May, 1990. Yeah, Yo, you're a baby, huh? <laughs> I know. Got so much growing to do. Uh, oh. uh, so what do we got there? Uh, that's uh, 14, 15, five, and one, six. Yeah, is that right? That's correct. Okay. Okay. So um, you are in a two-year. Okay. 
And listen, the two year is where the main talk comes. The two year okay. is where you need to listen to advice. Okay, this is a year that you don't want to also like get the wrong advice. So mm -hmm. this is where the scam artists get out. You know, they oh, promise yeah. of, of Again, a better Lebang. life. Be careful of the fraud, Lebang. Yeah. <laughs> also, like, come and learn this course. We'll teach you the best things in life. You know, so really they're taking oh. us to the, to the eight. And that's where scam artists get us. They, they take us right from number one and they want to skip all the process and jump straight into the eight. And we go, wow, okay, cool. We don't have to go through all this hardship. I can get my free ticket and just go. Mm. So the two year is a challenging year. It can be challenging because it's emotional. Lots of emotions are going to come up. Lots of decisions. And with the two year, it is like you might be undecided. You might not make decisions. And that's where your mentors and guides come in to help you and advise you. So always with big decisions, don't talk to somebody that you look up to and then talk to another person. So get a lot of advice. And then right. put it all together, and then right. make so, the. So, Brad, I'm sorry we had to rush through the last little bit here, but the, you know, if people want to have their own um, numerology kind of their charts worked out and and plot a course for themselves, if if you know if you're into the numbers, then uh, just tell us how the best way to to get ahead and to to get information from you is. Like, how how do we contact you, and how how can people get their own personalized chart? Okay, great. Um, they can just. Email me on info at Brad Forbes Consulting. Info at Brad Forbes Consulting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll just put that up on the screen now. Um, and then, and that's where people can, can get all this info, right? Correct. Is it, is it Brad Forbes Consulting COZA or, or dot com? No, dot C dot ZA. How's it, law? <laughs> Morning, everybody. I had to come and say hello. How's it, Law? <laughs> how's it? Gee, how's it, Paulette? Well, hello, everybody at Cliff Central. You're so lucky that you work at Cliff Central. Ah. <laughs> listen. I'm at the radio. <laughs> All right, listen, uh, Law, tell Brad we say thank you. We got to go, but uh, this was awesome, and it's, gr it's great to have him on and you. You were a bonus. We didn't know you were going to join. Yeah, I just thought I'd added a little bit of love. <laughs> 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 love back oh, at have you. Have a beautiful day. And I'll tell Brad as well. Thanks, guys. Thanks Cheers, so much. Cheers, guys. Very cool. All right. Sure. There it is. Take BradForbesConsulting.co.za and you can uh, get your own chart done. Very, very nice. We'll be back with a whole lot more, including This Is Us in the next hour on CliffCentral.com. Stick around. Yo, I put it like, wow. This that sound. These oaks don't work hard like me. I hope they know by now.
Just because it's about technology, connecting your business to the rest of the world doesn't mean you need to send rockets to space and use complicated solutions. Want to simplicate things? Well, join Jaku Voigt, who is the CEO of Catalytic, on the Unbundled podcast. With skin in the game and a keen focus on educating and assisting you and your business, Yaku decodes all the aspects of connectivity, security, and cloud solutions. Unbundled is brought to you by Catalytic and is available on cliffcentral.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, all right, all right. Uh, cliffcentral.com on a Tuesday morning. Uh, it's um, Bulelo's last show. He's going to be coming to America. <sighs> so sad. Yeah, it's true. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Le Don't Bangu cry Turin. from the Argentina. <laughs> no. Hey, uh, Greg uh, sent a song for you. You want to hear it? Sure. <laughs> right, play this for you. Hey, you prick, get the hell out of here. Fuck on, believe it. Fuck on, believe it. Fuck on, believe it. Fuck on, believe it. I mean, guys come cry six months later. 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 Fuck on, believe it. Fuck on, believe it. Wow, Greg is talented. Fuck on, believe it. 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 <laughs> All right. So wow. good. Sure, Greg. Oh, that is so funny. <laughs> Please send that to me. It's definitely, I definitely want to have that on hand. That's all. <laughs> yeah, you never know when you're just going to need to whip that out. <laughs> well. In the next uh, half hour, we will be doing This Is Us, and we'll be joined by uh, Yatish Nasi and, of course, Leban Khosana, who is already here. And uh, we've got Songez Azibi joining us, the former editor of The the Business Day. And, of course, he's now the chairman and co-founder of something called the Rivonia Circle, which I'll tell you a little bit about later on. Very, very interesting initiative that he started and something which just fits perfectly into all of our conversations so far regarding This Is Us and kind of the way forward for South Africa and what we've all got to start thinking about. Looking forward to that. All right, so um, we've got a couple of things to still get to before um, Bulelo leaves, but um, you had a question, Lebang, and I thought this is interesting. There's so much focus these days, and you're a parent, you've got, you've got four kids, and it is hard to know these days as a parent whether you're doing the right thing or not. It was always hard because mm. you know there's no like perfect guidebook. There's no Bible of parenting. And all parents get some of the things really, really right and some of the things really, really wrong. But there's this massive amount of pressure on parents these days. And I mean, this must be something that you and so many other moms and dads contend with. Mm. It's like, how much do you need to worry about your kids, whether it's a, a, a mental health thing or an emotional thing or anything else? And how much do you have to treat by therapy, you know, whether that's inside the family or out? And how much do you have to treat with medication? And obviously, they're serious problems, and they're not so serious problems. But like, what kind of what kind of issues are you are you thinking about when you ask so, that? Question? Yeah, like what what really sparked my you know my mind when with regards to this was when um, I signed up my kid into well one of my kids into a new school. Um, you know, the principal was quite um, explanatory about listen, we've got in house you know uh, psychologists okay. and therapists, yeah. and if anything comes up. We can help you handle it. And I've, I don't think I'd ever thought of that as like an actual option. Like if something's going wrong, I try sort it out and I try work it through with my kid and with my partner and we'll see if we can help him or her. But when mm. she was like really stressing and it made me realize that a lot of parents just generally use this as an option because maybe they are unable to or perhaps getting external assistance will help get to the solve quicker. And it just got me thinking like when I was in primary, we didn't have that as an option. But what Mm -hmm. was a definite thing was a lot of kids were taking things like Ritalin and like blah, blah, blah. And oh, this one reads too slow. So he's popping that pill. And I just kind of like wondered like, hmm, you know, there's all these external factors, but like which ones are like right? Which ones are wrong? Is there a bit too much of this? I guess I've just got cold feet with regards to if 
my kid is struggling in school, you know, let me take them to the in-house therapist at school or let me yeah. give them this medication. It's, it's, it's something, well, it's a bridge I'm not really ready to cross. I think, I think the whole of society is just over-medicated. If you think about how many people are on antidepressants and how many people are on, um, you know, uh, ADHD medicine, Ritalin and so on. And, and if you start kids off with that stuff, and obviously I'm not a psychiatrist or psychologist and I'm in no position to offer valuable expert information here, but like mm. it does seem to me that this has become the, the art for parents who don't want to actually do the hard work themselves, that they just they get a doctor to prescribe something. I think the whole of society is over-medicated, not just mm. kids. We have a medicine, yeah, no. medicine for that. They discover a new uh, condition or they diagnose a new condition and the next thing you know, there's a pill for it, right? Yeah, no, definitely. And it, I guess what you're saying about like, it's the solution for most parents. I kind of think that parents and, and as one, you know, it's not that you're running away from your responsibility. You always do need assistance in certain places. And if there's people that maybe have more years than you mm -hmm. in the field, sure. I, I think about my little brother who was actually at a school um, that it kind of broke him into pieces. He was in a boarding school in, in Joburg and Houghton and he absolutely hated every single moment. Yeah. But the person that was there for him was the school like psychologist and the school therapist oh, really? till huh. this day like when I speak to him he's like oh no I'm gonna go see lady blah 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 because she helped she carried him through high school as a young black boy in that environment and so and not to say that that's the role that my parents should have played but it you know yeah. it's kind of like I, I look at it like that where it's like oh you needed this level of support perhaps you couldn't get it and you got it from an external source so it's it's something i'm still exploring i find it all very interesting i didn't have um we we didn't have any school psychologist yeah no. it's it's <laughs> Look, a I'm, new I'm, I'm very old <laughs> that, uh, obviously obviously it doesn't count but you know, in my day, that what they would do is send you to the quarry to mine something if you were having a, a hard day. <laughs> come back, come back with some, um, you know, some granite that you'd chiseled into a nice field. <laughs> or, or they'd just make you run around the field, or they'd make you uh, chop down a tree, or you know, something uh, that, that would get your mind off of yourself. Yeah, uh, like therapeutic. I or burn a witch back in your day, you know what I mean? Yeah, right. We used to burn witches. That's quite right. Mm. Uh, thanks for reminding me, Bulelo. Those were no, the no worries. No worries. But Safety net. I do think there's a really good argument for having a school psychologist, especially because there are a lot of kids these days who've grown up yeah. in very difficult circumstances, especially in a country like ours, right? You can't ignore that. Mm. And if some people think that that's soft and that we are treating, you know, kids with, with sort of padded rooms and, and kid gloves and all that kind of thing, I think we're missing the point because these days we have discovered that there are better and worse ways to help kids and there are better and worse ways to raise kids and sometimes oh. it's not equally distributed and some kids come to the school and they've got big issues they've got like domestic violence at home or there's a alcoholism or some other problem that they're dealing with now, i don't see any reason why schools if they can provide this stuff and obviously some mm. schools have more resources than others why they why they shouldn't? I think I think it's a good thing because for a lot of those kids, that will be as it, as was the case for your brother. That person will be their savior. Yeah, yeah. I'm not ready, but we'll we'll see. Hopefully, I won't have to cross that bridge. Bulelo, did you have uh, a school psychologist? Oh yeah. I mean, I didn't. I, I, I it wasn't made for me, but for sure, for sure. No, no. They can, uh, I was very lucky. All, all the guys were very lucky at my school. If you if you're going through the most, we we had incredible. I have to say. In incredible resources for for everybody absolutely incredible and, and actually my school was one of the first certainly in the midlands to really really um take that angle um like because it's a, it's a tough environment as well so i, I also don't want to compare that environment with, to uh, compare to other environments but it's it's a it's a br bloody brutal environment so it, it's it's yeah no we, we were awesome we were awesome but never use it well, not, not not for me I had it at home my whole life. I did see a comment that I think uh, Togozo made earlier that they had a psychologist at school, a therapist, and uh, it was it was considered very uncool uh, to go and see her. I suppose that's also something that happens is, you know, if you go and see the, mm. the school shrink, it should be confidential, obviously. You should see them and nobody else should really know, right? Yeah. You, you, you know, it was quite unique. I, I totally agree. So I came up in like 
elite sports since I was 11. And so I've always had that feedback from really early, not just at home, fortunately with my mom, but I had that side of things from, from early on. And it was really starting to boom um, when I entered, uh, like uh, I was at something called the School of Excellence. And then I went from there and I went to school and um, yeah. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting conversation, I guess, on the other side of it to, to also have a working professional as a mom. Just so, uh, tell us again, you were at the school of excellence. Just say that again. Yeah, no, I, I was incredibly good at soccer. No big deal. I, I did play for South Africa at 13. Did anyone, I mean, did anyone get that? Did anyone uh, not hear what, um, what, what school was that? Let's hear that again. It was me, la, 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 you know, no, no big deal. School of excellence. I was, you know, Transnet paid, you know, probably a bit of corruption, but I mean, whatever. I can knock, I could kick a ball at an wow. elite level. It's not a big deal. It's not a big huh? deal. That I played in at the non cup, which is the World Cup for thirteen. Years. Did get you to <laughs> did did get you to Europe? I mean, yeah, you know, you did. That was yeah, a big yeah. thing, Leban. You, what, you, you, and I, <laughs> we were, we were just kind of coasting through school, getting nothing really impressive done. And uh, meanwhile, Mbulela well, was just, in the school of excellence. Yeah, yeah, but just for soccer, let's be very clear that that you do not have to be a bright spark. I, I've never had an average above C, by the way. So oh. let, please don't please don't let that great marketing fool you. <laughs> yeah, you can't you can't have it all. Also, Gareth, speak for yourself. I was yourself. what you call a dum dum. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, you did you do you were a massive overachiever, weren't you? Thank you. I, I literally yeah. was selling like airtime and and rip CDs at the age of thirteen too. So I was out here entrepreneuring my life from a very <laughs> young age, achieving in other manners. So please. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a dark time. It was a dark time. <laughs> if, we, if we could just go back to this thing for a second. There are a lot of kids who are being diagnosed with all kinds of, uh, you know, attention deficit disorders or anxiety or depression or whatever it might be. And most of those are probably absolutely correct. But there also are those parents who want their kids to have an excuse or where the parents want an excuse for what they could have done better or whatever it might have been. And then this disease presents this amazing opportunity. I say disease in inverted commas. Presents an amazing opportunity for everybody to get a free ride. You know, for everybody to, to just uh, take, take the time off here and not have to worry about, like, it can't possibly be my fault. It's got to be this, this thing that my kid has. And also, you can imagine all the parents getting together and like, ah, little Johnny has ADHD. Ah, oh, so does my little Sally. And they're all like having a having a big whinge about it together. I'm telling you, there's a lot of that that's happening too. You know, these helicopter parents, you know what I'm talking the, about. The great irony of it all is uh, a lot of it stems from this being the easiest time ever to be alive. And it's, yeah. you, you know, I, I've spoken about the, the, the sort of requisite complexity, which is, uh, you, you know, back in the day, if you weren't as complex as your environment, nature did the business for you. Now yeah. it's, it, it's, super it is the best time by a mile it's it's the easiest time ever to be a parent and it's not close don't have to worry about your baby dying largely speaking largely speaking no. you, right. you you can leave your baby no. you, you know what i mean so so that's led to a lot of you, you know people aren't as complex as the environment so the environment is evolving quicker than the people and if you want to look up um the the, the ashby's principle of of that requisite variety in biology it says an organism must, at the very least to survive, be as complicated as its environment. Now we impose limitations on children mm -hmm. because if you're an anxious parent, whatever, you, you, parents don't realize that they pass the, their limitations onto their kids. Mm -hmm. And that stunts their kids in an ever-evolving world. Like nobody cares about your little schnookums, right, in the real yeah. world. Is, right. is, so, my, uh, you, you know, my mother always used to say this thing to, to people, and I, I'll never forget it. The way she used to say it with this conviction is, be hard on your kids. You're, they're all you know. Don't worry about it. Like, like, stop trying to be the perfect kid. Be hard but, on your kids. It doesn't matter. These, they they don't know these, anything else. A lot of these parents are trying their best to do the exact opposite. They want their perfect. kids. Coddling their have, kids, yeah. They want their kids to have the easiest possible life. And, I mean, you can't really say that. You don't understand that because what parent wants their kid to suffer? Yeah. What they what they forget is that uh, in order to develop character, they probably had to suffer. And if you don't give your kids a chance to develop that character, and you don't give them a little bit of friction to deal with, mm. and you know you can decide how much is a little and how much is a lot. I'm not a parent, and I'm not going to tell you how. But if you make it too easy for your kids, that's where you end up with these these um 35 year olds who are still living at home with their parents. 
yeah. and have still not found a job. I mean, I was talking to someone the other day about a, a friend of his. He went over there and and she's been dating this dude who's, whose dad is still paying his rent and whose dad is paying, who bought, just bought him a car. And he's, he's 30. And if your parents are still funding you, in, in, and I mean even indirectly, let's say there's, you know, because this guy, apparently this guy works in the family business. So he probably doesn't even have a real job. Yeah, soft as hell. And then he has the cheek. This guy has the cheek to say to this friend of mine, so what do you do? And he was like, hang on a second. Are we going to really go down this road? Because you haven't even done anything. Done anything. Your, yeah. your response is zero in your life. And you're going to ask me, what do I do for a living? You know, and kind of yeah. look down on me because I'm not earning what you are. I mean, it's just crazy that there are people who want to make their kids so weak and so soft that the only thing those kids can do is kind of wait for the parents to die so they can inherit money or wait for the parents to die because there's no one else who can guide them. And then when that happens, they just fall apart. Then they really screwed. It's, it's really dangerous, guys. I mean, we, we speak about it lightly, but like when you live it and when you see it, it's really things that start from a young age. It's number one, we all have different parenting styles. Like I've got yeah. a completely different parenting style to my mother and to my friends, et cetera, et cetera, to even my brother. And right. when those things get tested, I mean, it's in the smallest things like a child feeding themselves. If I believe that my child is at the age where he can feed himself, let him do that. And then somebody yeah. else will be like, no, but you need to feed him. It's like, ugh, like you were raising little humans that are going to turn into adult assholes. And I say this a lot because it happens where you're dealing with these narcissistic 30 year olds who, as you're saying, living at home, have no cooking clue about what the real world actually has to offer. And it's really hard as a parent because you're fighting that internal battle of, oh, but I don't want to see my child suffer. And dude, you kind of have to let your child suffer a little bit. So also with some of the our like our parents and their generation, it's like they've worked their asses off to not to have the soft life, to offer the soft life to us. But the like, I, I guess, again, that thing is I, I we didn't ever struggle, you know? So how do we see the value in work, in working hard and the, the struggle and appreciating what they do for us? It's just a constant battle and it's a cycle that's passed down. So you inherit yeah. all this money and then you squander it. And then what are yeah. your kids going to have, you know? Or, so there has maybe, to be a level of suffering. Maybe you don't inherit any money because you've already sucked your parents dry before they die. Uh, Snaya says, I have a problem with parents who outsource their parental responsibilities to teachers. That's another big problem. Yeah. Most of these Oof. kids become very unruly because there's no discipline at home. Well, yeah. I just want to throw yeah. something else in there. I remember when I was a kid, I grew up on this farm. So we would, my brother and I would like disappear in the holidays. We would, we would leave after breakfast in the mornings, which was early. And we'd go down to the river and we'd build forts and we'd make swings in the trees and we'd, you know, we'd, we'd make weapons out of sticks and we do all kinds of crazy stuff and my mother wouldn't worry as long as we were home before the sun went down and she didn't know what we were getting up to and she wasn't worried because like it was just how we grew up these days i wonder how many parents would let their kids just go and play for the day and not worry about them and my brother and i yeah. had a wild time we used to we swam in the the dirty rivers we used to climb up mountains we used to take the dogs everywhere. We used to fight with sticks. We used to do all kinds of crazy stuff and, and build like proper, you know, little forts and things. It was amazing. We loved it. We had a very, very happy childhood. But mm -hmm. there was no real, like my parents were never like, oh, be careful. Uh, you know, you got to watch out because there's this, that um, there were probably snakes that could have bitten us. There were probably, uh, you know, dangerous vagrants running around. Who knows? But it didn't enter our, our reality. These days, obviously, parents can't do that because where do you go? And unless you grow up in the middle of nowhere, it's kind of impossible to have that. But I know Pumi used to tell me how she grew up in Soweto, you know, and she would, she would literally walk down the street in Soweto and her friends would be there and she'd party with them, you know, have a little, uh, you know, go to, the, go to the, the, the spaza shop on the corner. They'd talk, they'd listen to music. And as long as she was home by nighttime, her parents weren't worried. No. Yeah. That doesn't happen anymore. And if you don't get out there and expose yourself to some of the real world, I don't think you're ever really going to grow up. But you, you know what's interesting to me? People only ever talk about the quality of the parenting. <clears throat> like I was talking to one of our colleagues on the weekend. We we're having coffee. And I said to him, you know, in hindsight, one thing that can happen, and like my parents never did it to me, but it's okay to say, 
a child is a shit kid. Because yeah. why are you protecting children? Yeah. It's, it's almost like you're scared they're going to break. They're not going to break. It's always she's a shit mom. And I don't mm. understand that we we think these little things are going to break. Like, you can have shit kids. Like, you are mm. a shit kid. Mm. And we yeah. should be able to say that. But, Lord, Bell, I mean, you've seen where it they goes. Are, oh, my, really not mine. Oh, yeah. There are horrible kids. I mean, no, I and, and, but, really... but we have to put that into the ecosystem is that, number one, I just want to go back to – um. Uh, uh, earlier is we, you, you do need a community to raise your kids like also these people that are trying to be perfect mums off youtube videos d d stop it's ridiculous you need the community and you need extra feedback people yeah. all of us here as we sit are extremely limited we are all extremely yeah. limited uh, in terms of the human experience lebang is so different for me as to you lebang should expose her children to me and you and <clears throat> yatish and whoever you know george bezos i don't i don't know who lebang wants to hang out with but but do, do you understand what i'm saying is i i think it becomes dangerous to to that um sort of complexity requisite again to think mm. you're uh, no my children must grow by my house rules and laws you, you're a ridiculous person for saying that and your ego is unbelievable by the way if you think that but there's a line there <laughs> there's definitely a line that you cannot cross because another problem is taking for example parenting advice from people that absolutely don't have kids like, sure, there's only so much that 100%. you know, but for the most part, it's people that have never even spent more than four hours with a child that'll tell you, oh my gosh, look at them. I would never do that to my child. <laughs> you don't have no. one. You do not have one. So there's definitely sure. a limit and a line that you need to draw when it comes to taking that advice. Make sure you take it from the right people. Make sure you are engaging with people that have raised children, with your grannies, your grandpas, whoever you trust, because listening to every and any opinion will take you down a rabbit hole. Like you're saying, the likes of YouTube, the, the the parenting gurus on Twitter and on social media. No, like find what works for you well, and your circle, and then you know put put some truth in it. But but okay, that's that's fair comment, and I do agree with you. Like, shut up if you don't have kids, and don't tell people who do have kids what to do with them, especially if you've only interacted with them for a few minutes. But there's also that school of thought that says if your t if your child ends up a complete asshole and grows up and causes just all kinds of hell around them, like there's there's some I think there's some responsibility on the parents for that. And, you know, Ben always used to say on the show, like if the kid behaves really badly and does something criminal, then the parents should go to jail as well. <laughs> I always like that. I always like that. I don't hate it because I believe in absolute responsibility. I've always told you in life, I was raised by a father who said, everything's your fault. Not, not just the good things. Everything. So, also, parents, you choose to have kids, please. Yeah. We, 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 the, 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 we can have empathy or sympathy, whatever the correct word is, but nobody said you must do yeah. the horizontal shuffle. You, you know, you enjoyed that part. Now you must deal with the snotty nose running around. Absolutely, sure. as well. Now you, now you've burdened <laughs> the whole of society with your your horrible child. I mean, your, your crying child. baby. Mm. Because because if yeah. your child's great, then you've helped society. You've added someone valuable to society. But if your child ends yeah. up being a monster, then you know you've made it worse. Anyway, yeah, I'm trying to get a 400 rand steak. Uh, to maybe don't bring your kids. You know what I mean? Maybe take them to spur. It's unbelievable. <laughs> oh, not spur. Unreal. No, but the, <laughs> I think like the, these kids are just getting worse and worse. I heard a story um over the weekend about a mother who has to prepare about five different meals because oh. her kids simply won't eat like the same thing. Whatever she prepares, oh it's like God. a no. She's got like three nannies. Every child eats oh, a wow. different thing for dinner. That blew my mind. Oh, I was God. like, you're clearly not black, number one. Number two, why <laughs> would you allow your children you know to make that decision? They are parenting if, you. you. You clearly just their sleep. I mean, it's ridiculous. If we'd said to our mom, oh, I don't want this and my sister and my brother wanted something different, she would have said, fine, you, you either eat what I'm giving you or you don't, or you don't eat. Yeah. 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 I, anyway, and just to a, finish off, I don't, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to be racist. <laughs> oh, when you start a sentence like that, it's going downhill. <laughs> Go. By the way. Go on. Go on. This but, is going to be good. Can white kids... Please stop calling their parents by their first name. Please, <clears throat> it's please. very traumatic for a black person who please. goes to a home. Uh, Kathy, Mapilelli's here. We're gonna. Please. Can you make us a hot dog? But don't you bloody put. I don't want mustard, mom. No, no, no. Unless we've got Dijon. Hey, Kath, I don't. Yeah, man. Kath, can you make us wow. some drinks? My friends are here. Just stop it. Yeah, and Just next thing, stop. Stephen's coming just now. Oh, Stephen pitches Steven, up. It's, it's his uncle dad. with a grey beard. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so just a thought. This is actually triggering because oh. it, it, it as much as it's a it's that side. It's actually creeping in. My nephew does the same thing. He calls his dad by his first, and I hate it because now my son is like, "Oh well, this must be the norm." I'm like, "Listen here, little boy." You dare call me by my first name. You'll see this hand on your face. Just stop, guys. So I'll leave you on that. I'm not a racist. But. Yeah, listen, <laughs> your, your parting shot is not a weak one, um, Bulelo. Enjoy your trip to America. We'll be catching so up with you on the show. And um, yeah, do all the fun stuff and send us lots and lots of good content from the Super Bowl, from the NBA All-Star Game, and from all the other cool stuff you're going to be doing. And uh, we, will, we will speak to you in the next couple of weeks anyway. We'll, we'll All right. Up. See you guys later. You. Stay safe. Bye. Good stuff. Thanks, Bulelo. There we go. And he had to end off by like telling parents what to do and uh, <laughs> by bringing in like racism. That would that was a great strong way to end for Bulelo. Okay, so it is time for this is us, which of course involves me and Lebang and Yatish and you. And you can be a part of this. We would love to have you kind of join in the movement. It is a bit of a movement. Yatish, it's nice to see you again. How are you, sir? Good and you. How's everybody doing? Excellent, excellent. So we've got quite a lot to to talk about, and if you've been if you've been part of the This Is Us um, movement that we've started, you know every Tuesday morning, Yatish and uh, Lebang and I get into This Is Us with you, and as you know, it's all about having a mutual concern in finding new solutions through new ideas and new alliances, so we can overcome all these these obstacles which we have in South Africa, which we are conscious of. We're not trying to ignore them or avoid them. It kind of came a little bit out of the unrest and the riots that we had in, in July last year, which really affected a lot of people and, and made us all sit up and take notice and look at ourselves in the mirror and go, where are we going? So as we always do, we try to find the most important, influential, and interesting people we can to shed light on what they think South Africa at the moment looks like how they think we see ourselves, and also with ideas on how we can make it better and how we can take the enormous potential we have here and work it, magically craft it into something that can truly inspire and push us forward as a nation. So today, I'm really happy to invite to the show, and he's uh, here to chat to us this morning, Songez Zibi, who is, of course, the chairman and co-founder of something called the Rivonia Circle, which he launched in January. So it's brand new. But the name Songez Azibi is well known to many of us because, of course, he was best known as the former editor of The Business Day. Also, a well-known and respected social commentator. Um, he's someone who has an extensive corporate experience spanning 23 years. He was a communication and corporate affairs professional and leader in diverse industries spanning the auto, mining, media, banking, and financial services. And Songezo, it's a great pleasure to have you here with us this morning. How are you, sir? I'm good, thanks, Gareth. How are you? It's, it's good to be with you. Thank you so much. And Yatish and Lebang and I are very excited to talk to you. First of all, if I can start, Songezo, um, you are the chairman of the newly launched Think Tank, which is called Ravonia Circle. I actually saw you on TV the other day uh, explaining to people what it was and what the purpose of the Ravonia Circle is. Um, can you tell us what it, what it is and, and how it was received by people? Because you only launched, uh, you know, a month ago. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Gareth, and, and good morning to, to my friend Yatish and, and Lima. So, um, yeah, we launched in, in January, or we introduced the concept in January. So I would describe Rivonia Circle as a, as a think tank with a difference, because we're not only going to investigate and produce really great ideas, we also fully intend to do something about them, including the training of leaders. Uh, the second thing that we, we're going to do is, unlike traditional think tanks, we are also going to interact with many, many ordinary people, thousands of them, in fact, right mm. across the country. Our first community engagement will be in Toyando in, uh, in February. So we're not going to uh, just sit here in Johannesburg or the metros. We're going to go out to all sorts of interesting places and, and meet real people. It's a, a terrific idea and I'm, I'm thrilled that South Africa is now starting to this is a sign of maturity where you end up with think tanks and NGOs like this that are, that are coming up from people like you who've always been very influential in society you know we've we, I've looked to you um, as being one of those people who can see the wood for the trees I actually read an article of yours and maybe if you if you don't mind Yatish and, and Debang if I could just bring this up quickly I saw something that you wrote about the JSC the Judicial Services Commission and their yeah. interviews Chief Justice, which I've kind of been watching. I saw 
Judge Meyer, who I thought was an incredibly powerful candidate. And uh, she is one of the front runners. We, of course, don't know until the president announces it. But you wrote some interesting things about your own observations around the JSC and not the quality of the judges necessarily, but the quality of the people doing the interviewing. And I thought that you made some very good points. Do you want to just give people the kind of executive summary of what you wrote there? No, sure. Thanks, Gareth. In fact, as it usually happens in South Africa, I'm, I'm being rounded on, on social media for saying uh, Justice Maya should not be appointed. I, I said nothing of the sort. I actually hope that she, she gets appointed because I think this, she, she's eminently qualified. But there are a couple of things. I mean, one of the terms I use uh, in the article, which is quite rough, I, I talk about intellectual dwarfism uh, amongst quite a few of the commissioners. These hearings are there to assist the president to make the right decision. It is not really for the Judicial Service Commission to choose. So in the first instance, there appears to have been a misunderstanding of the mandate of the Judicial Service Commission in terms mm. of what it does. Section 178 says they are supposed to advise the, the government. So when I'm advising you, Gareth, I don't hold a press conference and say, well, this is what I'm advising, Gareth. I mean, this was not for the public. It was for you. You can then make a decision. So that's just one example. But more importantly, Gareth, these hearings are supposed to be an examination of the professional history of these people. They are, uh, they are integrity in their jobs. Yes. But very, very important, they are judicial or or constitutional philosophy, their approach to jurisprudence. What mm. philosophy in relation to our constitution would they apply? Because we are a constitutional state. That's what we want to know. It is instead, not an inquisition instead, where an advocate who's could... lost cases before the same judges gets to round up on them and say, why did you rule against me? I mean, it, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Mm. And, and I like that term intellectual dwarfism. And of course, it is insulting. But the point is that you, you expect a quality of question and you expect a quality of thinking among the members of this Judicial Services Commission, which will give us insight into who the best candidate for chief justice might be. But as you say, to advise the president and to ask stupid questions like there was the one which Judge Meyer handled, be handled beautifully where someone says, do you think South Africa is ready for a for the first black female, yeah. you know, Supreme Justice. And we, we, everybody, everybody, I think, except the people on the panel, went, oof, what a stupid question. Like what we have How to be, you know? yeah, we have to be prepared for before we can accept a woman as Chief Justice. Are you joking? And this is insulting, not only to her, but to women in general. And frankly, it's completely unrelated to the purpose that the JSC is meant to have, as you've already outlined. So I love this about you because you, you look at these things and you aren't afraid to be um, you know, uh, shouted at in social media. And, and that does happen. But you've got to say these things. Thank God you're saying them because we need more people to say them. You know, Last week we had um, Bonang Mohale on from um, Business Unity South Africa. And he had some, also some very hard and tough things to say about South Africa. Uh, what I love about you and him is that you're not backing down on this front. We need to hear the truth and we need to be confronted with the truth. And Yatish Lebang, hold that mirror up, right? Uh, Lebang, we can't hear you. I'm just going to put this. There we go. Now we can. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, fab. Um, so hopefully the think tank will be a place where, you know, these conversations can happen. And, you know, I think the involvement of the communities is like, it's it's really what's taking it to another level. But in, in finding the name, I noticed that you specifically made reference to the Ravonia trialists. And I think, Songas, I just want to know if like there's a specific reason for that. And if so, like what, what led you to just like finalizing and saying the Ravonia circle is going to be called this? And what's the reference to the Ravonia trialists? So, Levan, they, that was very deliberate. Both Rivonia and Circle, uh, mm. both both words. Rivonia because the Rivonia trialists did something that looked impossible, something that was far bigger than themselves, and they stuck with it for the rest of their lives. And and it's that level of commitment to something bigger that we want to instill, not just in ourselves, but mm. in everybody who comes across uh, our work. That is. 
it must always be bigger than just what you can do for, for yourself. So that's the first thing. The second, there are two reasons for the use of that word. The first is that on the African continent, a circle represents community and dialogue, community dialogue in particular. We sit in a circle and we discuss issues that affect the community, that affect the, the family. And there is no hierarchy there in the sense that there are people are sitting at the top table on the stage mm. and the rest of the people are sitting down. And, and that's one of the reasons we are emphasizing having conversations that would otherwise be held only in, uh, in, in marble floors and, and, you know, and, and fancy offices and conference rooms mm. in normal communities because this stuff is equally important to all South Africans. And the final one is we are also inspired by the Vienna Circle. The Vienna Circle was a, a group of philosophers and, and, and thinkers in, uh, in Europe in the early 20th century. Albert Einstein was one of them, Karl Popper was another. And they produced books and other great works reflecting on the state of Europe, democracy and, and humanity at the time. But they were committed to evidence. A lot of South African politics involves a lot of dishonesty, lying actually, blatant lying at the JSE, the JSC and elsewhere. It is important that the ideas we place on the table are honest in the sense that they can be examined, the evidence behind them can be examined and found to stack up. Mm. Yeah, Tish, um, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. I, yeah, we've, I mean, I've obviously met you in, in, in previous lives before, but um, I suppose the question from my side is if I, if I look at, you know, particularly I think we'll give the, the website link after as well for everyone to, to sort of go on and, and get a sense of, of what your ambitions are. But, you know, you've got almost three spheres that, that I sort of see you sitting at, at the intersection of, right? There's um, obviously trying to engage with, with sort of private and, 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 and the sort of corporate um, elements of South Africa. There's, you're going to have to, I think in some way um, engage uh, the, the the sort of political system, and then to your point, you know, you've been really active at this point, and also working at discourse from the community. Now, if I take any one of those three spheres on their own, they're very complex. If you do work in the community, it has you know its own set of challenges. If you're in corporate or sort of private South Africa, it's got its own set of challenges. Politics, we all know, um, absolutely is challenging. Mm -hmm. um, so why would you, you know, the, 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 to put yourself in the middle of all three seems like a really uncomfortable place to locate yourselves, you know, and, and I'm glad you're brave enough to do so. Um, but I think the first thing is, yeah, what on earth were you thinking trying to take this on? Um, and the second thing is, you know, what do you think we need to bring those three spheres together? Because I think we've seen a lot of the fact that because they operate independently, um, not only do we have first world and, and, and third world challenges, we also have like a political system that's going this way and like private citizens that, that go this way because they realize oh, it's easier to do it on our own. So what do you think we need to knit those three together, Songs? Uh, thanks, Atish. I think, in fact, you, your question is right at the heart of why we set up the Rivodia Circle. These three or more spheres of South African society that are going in opposite direction. And in many ways, each one of them is broken. Our view, certainly my view, is that South African society is broken, uh, almost completely broken in, in many ways, right? Whether you look at community, you look at the political system, you look at the economy, you look at the, the state of social order in, in general. It's just happening so slowly that with each degenerate step, we don't quite feel it. Mm. But what is missing? What is missing is a set of principles and values that unite us. We might disagree on how to do them, but those principles and values need to unite us. So when we talk about the constitution, we just talk about the constitution as some abstract thing. But how do we distill what it asks us to do, what it stands for? And that is one of the reasons we have declared that our outlook at the Rivonia Circle is social democratic for two reasons. The first is that we believe our constitution is social democratic in outlook. Secondly, we also believe that a lot of South Africans, possibly the majority, are instinctively social democratic in outlook. So what are the values of, what are social democratic values? There are four. It's freedom, it's equality, mm -hmm. it's justice, and it's solidarity. 
Now, if you ask whether a South African has any view of those, I think generally they would say those resonate with me. You mm. can then have a conversation about what they mean to you, but generally they resonate with them because we were for a very long time an unfree people, so you're never going to take freedom away from South Africans without a fight. Yeah. Right. Uh, the second thing, we were you know, an unequal society in many ways and still are, and South Africans want to be treated equally. And so South Africans right. want justice in many ways. And finally, we South Africans don't like leaving other South Africans behind. You, you will find a greater sense of community at a broader level here when there is an underdog that needs to be supported. Generally, South Africans will support that underdog or somebody at a disadvantage. And the anger they have against corruption and so on has to do with the fact that so many South Africans are getting left behind as a consequence, right? So we've decided that this is the social contract we are going to give ourselves the assignment of fashioning for the country so that you can bring these three sectors together and in order to, to map a way forward. I, I, I love that. And I think that those are values which all of us in South Africa have uh, in common. But I, I, I do have to, to quote you because, you know, the, the problem with being a, a man who's written so many editorials over the years is that you kind of have to be consistent the whole way through. And, and you've, done a, you've done an amazing job of that. I know lots of people who've changed their mind or evolved or changed their opinion on things, which is also very good. But they sometimes have someone pull up an old quote. Now, this isn't so old, but you recently said, um, to save South Africa, we've got to give up on the ANC and form civil society groups like the Ravonia Circle. Um, we are throwing good money at bad politicians. They are never going to fix what they have deliberately destroyed. So... What do you think South Africans have given up on? And, and how do we all start to do what the Ravonia Circle is trying to achieve here? Because there are little things that all of us can start doing in our own lives, in our own communities, to start making a difference. I think South Africans are beginning to lose hope, actually. I, I think so. We did a survey at the, at the Ravonia Circle. In, uh, in fact, focus groups, about eight, I attended about six. And, uh, and a survey at the beginning of December, focus groups in November, and a survey at the beginning of, uh, of December. And almost 70% of South Africans that we, both in the focus groups and in the, in, the, in the survey, say they feel the country is going in the wrong direction. They feel despondent, they feel hopeless, they feel unsafe, and so on. And so there is something spiritual in a way that's emotional that South Africans are beginning to lose. And despondency breeds behaviors which are which are unhelpful. But but on to the to the quote that you uh, that 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 you shared there, the Gareth. We have a very specific objective, and it's very important for people to know because some are going to accuse us of being political. In fact, I want to say that accusation is true. We have political intentions. And those political intentions are informed by a very real problem. That problem is with the decline of the ANC. In fact, there was a report yesterday about the July riots that you referred to, which mm. said that the problems in the ANC are posing a security risk to the country, such as we saw in, mm. July, in, in July of last year. So, but it's not just chaos and violence in the ANC. We are also going to have most likely a coalition government in 2024. If it looks anything like the boorish, really bad behavior we see in the metros and the municipalities, imagine that happening at the union buildings in country. Mm -hmm. If yeah. that happens, then we might as well just give up on the country. What we also know is that because everybody is smelling proverbial blood in the sense that the ANC is on the way down, it's all about grabbing power at the moment for a lot of the political parties. It's all the frustrating mm. part who goes into which position. So that's the second thing. That's a priority of the politicians. The third, I am not being insulting. This is a fact. These guys cannot run two brain cells to produce a good idea. <laughs> One. And secondly, they actually do not have the capacity to implement any of it. They, they mm. genuinely don't, a lot of them, right? And I'm speaking as somebody who interacts with a lot of politicians. Honestly, half of them I would not have in a social conversation and have a meaningful conversation. They are that bad. So we must mm -hmm. not be naive and think that these same people who are greedy, who are after power, who don't have time or the capability to produce ideas, let, anything, let alone doing anything about them, 
I'm miraculously in 2024 going to become brilliant, capable, and, no, and basically not turn back into run. That's stupid. There is no chance that they're going to do that. So we mm-hmm. have to do the work now because even for civil society, a lot of organizations are single issue organizations. I'm passionate about the right to information, or education, or whatever the case might be. That's mm-hmm. not how you turn the country around. We have to agree on a set of national priorities and have the right people with the right capability and skills to do something about those uh, national priorities. And that's what civil society has to work on. We've simply decided to be the brain's thrust of that potential effort. But Songhezo, I mean, you, you just highlighted, and I don't think anyone disagrees with you, how disappointing our politicians are. But you know, there are a lot of us who are still looking for the leaders and, and refusing to stand up and, and, and accept the fact that they, they're not coming. It's going to have to be us. It's going to have to be, you know, this is us. Um, and we've, we're going to have to look in the mirror and we're going to have to face up to our, our faults and face up to our challenges and do something about it. Uh, it, it finally, go in the direction of turning that potential into something. But what do you say about people who, who, who will throw around that old adage of, well, you get the government you deserve? Do you think South Africa deserves a better government? Because the, you know you look around and you see not just in the majority party, but in all the all the smaller parties too, you see a huge gap. And leadership is not something that's easy to 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 engender in in a in a nation, and it's not something easy to cultivate. I don't know if we have those people. Do you believe we do? We do, we do, Gareth. But here's the thing: I mean, South Africa is a very religious and conservative country, right? And that's good and bad. It's good in the sense that uh, if I use my language uh, in Isitosa, there is a saying that says, Utiko Ngaitos Ngaitai, which means Mm. God helps those who are willing to help themselves. Yeah. (laughs) But at the same time, the negative side of that is thinking that you can hope and pray and and the miracle will appear. (laughs) And South Africans get caught between this, you know, in this dichotomy of praying for a miracle and so on. One of the things we want to do, Gareth, is to instill a sense of national purpose, in particular in the professional class. We've got to be honest, Gareth, the majority of us who are skilled, who've worked in the economy, in business or in the public sector, we've mm-hmm. got international experience and so on, do not want to get our hands dirty and become the leaders we complain are not there. Mm. We must take responsibility for that. In fact, we are so spoiled and dishonest that we are beginning to call Nelson Mandela and Bishop Tutu and others sellers. Why? Because we don't think yeah. the inheritance they left us was big enough or good enough. Yeah. We should have set up everything for us so that we can walk on a red carpet. Mm. That's actually really a bad attitude. It's mm. not only really dishonest, but it is a sign of weakness. And, and it's, we need it's to entitled. It's, it's yeah. ugly and it's, it's so un- ungrateful, you know, for the mm. The legacy of all these people who've come before and and we obviously know the big names that you mentioned like mandela and tutu and the rest of them but my god there are so many others who gave their lives who suffered yeah. tremendously whole generations of of our ancestors who've had a really really hard life and have given to us all the privileges that we now take for granted and we sit and complain i mean i totally yeah. agree with you this is the the attitude of a spoiled child yeah, yeah, it is, it's, a, it's a very bad attitude, Gareth, and I think we must have that conversation because many of us are walking around without a sense of, a real sense of purpose, actually. Mm. We, we've fallen into this a cycle of consumption and displays of consumption and complaining and displays of consumption and chasing after the next round and so on. And that's our lives. And when we don't get that extra rent or things don't turn out exactly the way we want, we look for somebody to blame, uh, mm. including, the consti- including the Constitution, <laughs> which has which which <laughs> enabled us to, to have this life and complain and, you know, and swear politicians and not get arrested for it. Uh-huh. I mean, so, yeah, so like, I guess on that, on that point, you know, you're saying we come, we, we've obviously got ourselves into this little lull. I, I think, you know, part of the challenge there is and everything you you're talking about and we're talking about here makes the the problem or the challenge very clear right Mm -hmm. i I think you know there's no ambiguity about what that challenge is i think where there is ambiguity for people is what's the action right 
you know, voting is clearly not one of them. So what's what's the action that 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 people because that's in the absence of the clarity for action, that's when people are complaining, just trying to make the extra buck going on with their daily lives and, and sort of whining from the sidelines. So, so the first and most important action yet is to change our attitude, right? I personally have taken the responsibility of leading the country in whatever way I can. That's really important as an attitudinal change. So that's the first thing. And that involves a lot of self-belief. I think not just in myself and whoever I am going to have around me. And I'm not saying I want to be president, but I've chosen the responsibility of leadership. That is that is the biggest thing that is lacking. Voting is part of the of the action, by the way. But we've, you know, votes don't just arrive. You you must have an idea that you are selling. It must be clear, it must be solid, and you must go out to South Africans and persuade them to buy into that idea. Mm. It is that continuum that we do not want to invest in. We just want to show up and vote. Now, what do you find there? You find politicians who would blend in with the rest of the unemployed if they were not politicians. And then we complain that, oh, there's nobody to vote for. But come on, man, you're it. You know, yes, there are so many great people who don't want to step up. You know, um, you, you mentioned voting, and, and Yatish, I'm glad you brought that up. South Africans also, like many other people all over the world, we're not unique in this respect. We go and we vote every four years, and then we think, okay, now they must just get on with it. And we, we, don't, we don't realize that just like freedom, whether it's freedom of speech, you know, the freedom to make choices of your own, the freedom to raise your kids the way you want to, all of those things you have to fight for every single day. Just because we go to the polls every four years doesn't mean that that is the sum total of your responsibility. And as much as we all want to be independent and run our own lives and, as you say, make a buck, Yatish, and many people are, are struggling to even do that in this economy, um, you have to realize that we're part of a, a community. And there are some things that it does require all of us in concert to achieve. And for, for all of the, um, the, the, this, this kind of lack of, of faith in government, the lack of faith also in the media, Songhezo, you know about this too, that there's been a tremendous deficit in trust between the public at large, government, the media, and many other things, including experts over the last two years, where people have just been lied to and, and you know they, they don't have the faith that they once had in these things. We've got to start working extra hard to reestablish that, don't you think? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. We've got to start doing that. I, did. I believe it all begins with principles and values and then behaving consistently to, you know, to, to make sure those we live, or we all live those values and we do very practical things in order to bring that about. But mm. we can't do that if we have got this commercial outsourcing model to democracy where we go and we vote uh, every five years uh, for these people to whom we have outsourced the job of taking the country forward and we go and do other things. What we know for certain is that over the last 25 years, it's been a bad tactic. We need to change course and, and right. become more involved. Mm. Absolutely. Um, from you, Lebang, any any kind of final comments? Because we've got to wrap this up, but I'm sure that... Uh, that yeah, yeah. Together. It's, it's, it's a pity that we've lost so much time, but um, I see in the comments, Racy Beck has, has just asked, like, mm -hmm. how can a regular person be part of change? Because obviously uh, they'd like to do something, but they just don't know what. So on one end, it shows that more and more South Africans want to get involved. They're yearning mm -hmm. to see a better tomorrow, but they just don't know where to start. So I know you spoke a little bit about, you know, changing our mindsets and realizing that it's a communal um, uh, thing. But if you can just quickly list and summarize before we go, what the average South African really just even at the ground can do in their daily lives to push forward to get a better tomorrow. So if anybody has got access to the internet, and I'm sure the, by virtue of the fact that people are here, they do. Go to revoniacircle.org. There are tabs that say get involved all over that website on whichever page that you click on. There are different ways in which you can participate and uh, we'll get in touch with you. You will okay, get so involved we if you want to. So we can actually go Lovely. straight to Ravonia Circle and, and there are going to be particular ways you can get involved there. That's terrific. Oh, yes. Yeah. Just one other quick comment here because there's some very good comments coming in. Yonda says, 
Songez is making a valid point. South Africans are caught in a dichotomy in their values, their leaders, and eventually their personal lives. It's mm -hmm. been clear that we need wider platforms to encourage people. And uh, Yonder continues, communities are no longer, they no longer culminate because they have been defranchised and divided by mainstream media being bought. It's clear that we need the voices m to be more on the ground to make change. Yeah, this is yeah. this is something we see happening though, Songezo. And listen, congratulations to you stepping up to the plate, uh, starting Ravonia Circle. You're not one of these um, these wallflowers who are going to uh, say something in the media and then just quietly disappear. Now you're taking responsibility. Let's hope that it encourages and inspires more people to do the same. Um, and and well done to you. We're all going to back you at Ravonia Circle. And thank you for being part of the show this morning. All right. Thank you, guys. Good to see you again, Yatish. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Very, right. very good. Thank you. And thank you to Lebang Yatish, and most especially to you for being part of this today. We will see you tomorrow bright and early at 6 o'clock. And don't forget Life with Lebang on Thursday, where she'll also be taking the whole conversation in This Is Us forward. Good to see you guys. See you tomorrow.